I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I have 10.32, and we have a lot of really good information to, to share today. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Laura Root, and I'm from Boise, Idaho. And um, this is the leadership session, for those of you who want to make sure you're in the right place. And I want to thank you so much for coming um, to be with us today. And many of you I communicated with during the registration, and I can't tell you how excited we are to have you here. Um, so just, again, just a brief, um, I live in Boise. I have been active, an active member of the church my whole life. Um, things changed for me about three years ago when I sort of realized that I'm gay and uh, sort of came out to myself about three years ago and then two years ago I came out publicly. Um, about six months ago, about seven, six, seven months ago I got married um, and my wife isn't here right now. So just a brief kind of what we're going to do here today. Well, hopefully most of us will be here together for the next two hours. But this next hour we're going to hear some stories from gay moments, and I, I really pray, um, I guess first I want to acknowledge there may be some, some tension as you hear some of the stories, and that's okay. Um, when I, I pray that the Spirit will be here with us today, and that, you're, that you will feel the Spirit as you listen to some of the messages that we're going to share today. Um, I don't really want to take up any more time with my introduction, so I'm going to let this, the speakers give, give you their introductions and tell you a little bit about who they are and their story. First, we're going to hear from Kent Carollo, and, and um, I'm really happy to say also I have been able to become friends with everybody that you're going to hear today, so um, my life has been blessed through, through knowing them. After Kent, we'll hear from Allison Barlow, and then after Allison will be Mike Klein. And I'll just let you guys sit up and sit down. And then hopefully at the end we'll have some time for some questions. So. Good morning. So the way this is set up, you won't be able to see much of my face. That's not a huge problem for me. <laughs> but my name is Kent Carolla. I live in Terraman, not too far from here. And uh, actually this is the first time I will be introducing myself as... Kent Carollo, a gay Mormon. That's never happened. And uh, you'll learn a bit more about that here in a second. So I'm keeping an eye on time. I don't want to uh, go too long, but um, I want to start here. Nutrition facts labels. Very familiar, right? So a nutrition facts label is able to give you a very quick sense of the composition of a product before you buy it or even taste it. You get the vitamins, the minerals, and at the very bottom, there's a list of ingredients. Those are listed, of course, from most abundant to least abundant. So you could say that the weight of kind of the identity of the product is somewhat in the balance uh, in the order of those ingredients. So by way of introduction, a nutrition facts label about me might look something like this. I'm a male, 31 years old, son, brother, uncle, friend, Mormon, a designer, journalist, BYU Hawaii graduate, Return missionary, scientist-ish, foodie, <laughs> music buff, divorce, and gay. Now for me personally, this label best represents what I feel like are the most significant parts of my identity and my makeup. But one year ago, my label looked a lot different. It read a little bit more like this. I was gay, I was hopeless, I was scared, <coughs> sinful, trapped, fake, disappointing, and as you may remember from certain nutrition facts labels, I may have contained, in my mind, about less than 1% of all of those other parts of my identity. It was tough. <laughs> Just a year ago, I was at one of my lowest points in my life. I was raised in Boise, Idaho, similar to Laura, actually, in an amazing family, six sisters, two amazing parents, a wonderful ward in Boise, very loving and encouraging people and a wonderful community as a whole. But well-meaning people occasionally would make comments like, that musician's so talented, but they're gay. Or, that woman sure is friendly, or very kind, but she's gay. And so at an early age, I started to think that no matter how talented I might be, no matter how friendly I might be, how kind or 
uh, outstanding a person I may be, if I was also gay, it seemed to devalue all of those different traits. And that is how my label started to look over my life. That was one of the first lies I started telling myself, was that if I was gay, nothing else really mattered. And that's why at the time, that was the first thing on my list that pulled the most weight, and unfortunately the most negativity to my identity. But in time, my perspectives changed. And so I want to talk about three particular perspectives that I had, and how they sort of changed as I grew up much of this in the last year. <laughs> the first one is this perspective of black and white versus color. I grew up with very black and white views of the world. You were a member or a non-member. You were gay or straight. You were um, active or inactive. You were married in the temple or not. There were a lot of extremes. And for a long time, that served me pretty well. It took me to a mission, it took me to a marriage, married an incredible woman in the temple, and it, it worked for a while. But at some point, I started to realize that there were two extremes that populated my personal identity. There was Mormon, which was my predominant one, most familiar one, then on the other side of the spectrum, there was gay. And I couldn't see how both of these identities could coexist. It was very black and white to me. This image is a vector. So it's an image that's been reduced to only black and white. There are no other colors, no in-between shades. And while at a glance you may get some idea what it is, it doesn't serve a great purpose at this point with only two shades. But when we introduce more values to the same image, the shades of gray that occupy the space between the black and the white start to flesh out the image even further, giving us a clearer picture of what we're looking at. But something is still missing. We need the color in order to make this image useful. Without it, we're looking at a black and white piece of modern art, maybe, at best. But now, we have something that has utility. It's useful, it serves a purpose that we couldn't have had without the full spectrum of values and colors. <coughs> my previous perspective of black and white didn't allow me to see my life or the life of others in the same way. But my new perspective helped me realize that each person has a value and a perspective that is beneficial. Those values can improve wards, families, and communities, and we can all help each other find the role and their values through personal revelation. But it's going to look different. If I want to be a father one day, that's going to look a little different than my buddies in college who went on to marry and are now having families. But I'm okay with that because I know my role, and I know that has value, and I know that every role has room in the world, in a ward, and in the plan of salvation. The second perspective that I long held is this idea of survive versus thrive. Much of my life, I've been told by, again, very well-meaning people that being gay is just like an addiction to overcome. You can overcome the, the burden or the weakness just like any addiction. Um, it can be fixed with enough dedication, um, and that everything will be made right after mortality. Unfortunately, that led me into survival mode. I thought, as long as I hold on really, really tight, <laughs> I'll be okay. I can read enough, I can pray enough, I can, I can serve enough. All of these things will make this go away. And that worked up until the point that it didn't. When I had already checked the boxes, I had served the mission, I had gone to a church school, I married in the temple, I did everything I knew how to do. And still, by the mid of last year, I was in a position where I was contemplating whether I wanted to live anymore. And it was literally survival every single day. My new perspective, <laughs> this is new for me, so forgive me if I get a little weepy. Uh, my new perspective is that being gay is not a curse. It is, in fact, a blessing. Being gay is a blessing that comes with specific talents and gifts. And it can therefore be used to bless, to love, to lift, and to serve others, just like any other gift or talent we may possess. And instead of waiting until after mortality for everything to be made right somehow, everything can be made better in mortality by embracing that part of our identity and using it to love, to lift, and to serve. This new perspective shifted me into thrive mode. I learned to use talents, to learn random talents. I call them my, 
my lady talents because I was raised by six sisters. I don't know why my handwriting is not good. Why I know how to cross the case with the best of them. But I, I could. And so I started looking for ways, instead of trying to hide those things, to own them and to use them to bless however I could, even when it was awkward or funny. And I realized that while I was holding on for dear life, I might be safe, but those fists were closed. And a closed fist can't open to anyone who might need to hold your hand. And that became very important for me to realize. My third perspective that shifted over the last few years is active versus active. I'll explain. <laughs> it's common verbiage in the church to say, are you active in the church? Or are they active in the church? By our understanding, active may well mean someone who attends meetings, holds a calling, has a temple recommend, or someone who is inactive, maybe doesn't engage in some or all of those activities. But a black and white view would suggest that if you're active in the church, you must be fine. You must be thriving, things must be good, whereas if you're inactive, you probably aren't doing so well and you are maybe in that survival mode. The common narrative is those who are inactive are maybe rebellious, they're apathetic, they were misled, they're ensnared by Satan, they're confused, any number of things. But that's not always the case. Many people approach leaving the church the same way they enter it. It's a very sincere process, they pray about it, it can be painful, but it's very, very personal, and that's going to look so different for everybody. We all thrive in different ways and in different places, and it's important to remember that active in the church doesn't always mean thriving, any more than thriving means you're active in the church. So a new perspective that I've considered is not are you active in the church, but are you active in your life? Are you active in your faith in God? Are you active in your family? Are you active in your community? Are you actively and anxiously engaged in a good cause? Are you actively feeling the spirit in your life? These are all much more indicative of our actual state of survival or thrive than simply showing up to church. And so I think it's important to consider changing that perspective from are you going to meetings? Are you holding a calling? Are you checking the boxes? To are you okay? Are you active in your life? So this has been my personal perspective. Any good journalist or scientist will tell you that one perspective is never enough. You need at least three, by my definition, <laughs> before you draw a conclusion. This has been my one perspective. You get to hear a handful of others today and more after this. So take it for what it is. My experience, my perspective, and then draw from the other ones you're going to be learning from today. The way I see it is your role here as a leader, a parent, a friend, is that you can help people to learn the value that they have in the spectrum of mortality and help them understand where they fit, what their role can achieve. Help them shift from just surviving to thriving, so that their hands aren't clenched so tight that they can't reach out. Respect the nature of personal revelation and offer support whether someone is active in the church or active elsewhere. One day, someone may approach you. It could be a ward member across your desk, a family member, a friend. It could even be your own child. And they may tell you that they're gay. And their label may look a lot like mine did. They may feel that gay is the most significant and detrimental thing about them. And they may feel a lot of other things too. You can help them to rewrite it. When they look at you and they say, Mom, Dad, Bishop, <laughs> whoever it is, I'm gay, look them back in the eyes and say, You are also a child of God. You are also loved. You are also needed. <coughs> you are also talented and valuable <coughs> and gay. Not all of those things, but gay. All of those things and gay. Thank you. Um, if I anybody wants to come in and sit on the floor, I don't think we're going to be using this space. I, I had no idea we were going to have so many people. It's really exciting. So if anybody wants to come up here, feel free. <laughs>
Kim, that was beautiful. I'm going to use this microphone so that you can hopefully hear in the back, too, because my voice sometimes cracks, especially when I'm emotional. And you made me cry already. So anyway, um, I like the idea of putting your label. What's your label? So I guess I'll tell a little bit about myself. My name is Allison Barlow, and uh, I've never married. I've been an active member of the LDS Church um, until recently. Um, this is tender, and it's hard to talk about. So, um, anyway, I've uh, served in a lot of leadership positions, one of which was uh, a member of the General Relief Society Board. Uh, and so, I'm going to give a general talk, <laughs> and I have to read it because my emotions are a little bit strong. Anyway, um, it comes from the heart. And I want to say thank you to each of you two for coming to court. This is an important topic, and uh, it's hard to do it. Anyway, today what I want to do is share with you my same gender attraction journey. As you can see, there are many emotions associated with this. And what I hope you see is these emotions are about love, about honesty, and about vulnerability. They are not about shame. I pray that the Holy Ghost will be with us today, that you'll hear the message that you need for you. My journey starts with two contradictory aspects in my life. An adult wrestle with my sexual orientation and my belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. From childhood, I've been taught in various methods of Ill, the ills of homosexuality. I'd heard extended family members shame my gay uncle behind his back. I'd heard jokes about the LGBT community in various settings, including church. I'd heard executives where I work talk about which aisle somebody or one employee was playing on, which side of the aisle. I'd heard sermons from men that I respected of the repulsive nature of such behavior. Sadly, I'd bought into this homophobia. In the same breath, I'd also had feelings of attraction and deep, intimate connections with women. I had dated men, and I not, desired nothing more than the traditional family of having a husband, having children, and connecting with the LDS community that way. Clearly that didn't happen. I never had married, and I haven't had children. What happened was I did have deep connections, emotional connections with women, and I acted on one of those connections in my late 20s. But shame and religious, religious shame seemed to break that up. I participated in the, relief, the repentance process at the time. This was a very sincere experience for me. I committed to locking my homosexual feelings in a stone chamber deep in my soul. I also committed to, to serve in whatever position Heavenly Father would call me to. He took me up on this. And I served in various uh, church columns at the ward, the stake, and the general level. I believed in a responsible contribution to the church, and I also had a sincere testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I felt very close to all those who I served with, and I also felt close to the Lord. And then without warning, about three years ago, my stone chamber began to really crumble, and my innate feelings started to surface. I would try really hard to subside these feelings, to imprison them, and to deny them. Yet the truth needed to be addressed. No one woman was the center of my attraction or my feelings at the time. It was more my soul's yearning to deal with this aspect of my life that I had denied. This scared me. What about my reputation? What about my standing in the church? How would friends and family accept me? What about my eternal salvation? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to get it together here. It seemed that there was so much at risk, but yet I could not deny these sincere, honest, genuine, pure feelings that I had. There was no kinky sex associated with it, no malicious or destructive behavior. No crude acts. It was simply that I wanted to share my life emotionally, spiritually, and affectionately with a woman. That was my truth. 
I share these concerns and fears of mine because most often, deep honesty is linked to risk and the fear of loss. The writer David White wrote, where we cannot go in our mind, our memory, or our body is where we cannot be straight with another, with the world, or with ourself. The fear of loss is, in one form or another, is the motivator behind all conscious and unconscious dishonesties. All of us are afraid of loss in all of its forms. Honesty lies in understanding our close and necessary relationship with not wanting to hear the truth. So I wanted to explore these feelings of honesty and the truth. So what is my relationship with the truth? My goal when I walked into my therapist's office was to sort through my feelings of honesty the best I could. I knew that I was a daughter of God. I also believed in the Lord and His Gospel. <clears throat> I felt like I was a good person. I was trying my very best to do good to, with society. Yet I needed to deal with my own circumstances. I asked her to help me to reach deep inside of myself and without telling me things, I asked her to help me discover my beliefs and understand what beliefs came from a divine source and what beliefs were man-made. I asked her to help me work through my feelings of isolation, condemnation, and the possibility of me losing my community. I had to do this holistically. I needed my head, my heart, my intuition, the Holy Ghost, spiritual teachings, and I wanted to stay in relationship with others. The spiritual teacher, Parker Palmer, wrote, Jesus set the example for us. He said, I am the truth. He walked among us. He called us to truth. Not in the form of creeds or theologies or worldviews. His truth and love broke down society's isolations, cruelty, division, and he dealt with injustices. Truth. Jesus' gospel is built on paradox, the capacity to entertain apparently contradictory ideas in a way that stretches our mind and opens our heart to something new. It negates absolutes because they leave us with uh, something partial or incomplete. Absolute thinking can quickly translate into political and social programs of division, manipulation, and oppression. Wanting to be in relationship with truth and understanding paradoxes and dealing with what felt a very predominant thinking uh, society, I oftentimes drew from 1 Corinthians 13. There seems to be this uniting and refining power of charity. I'd like to share a portion of these scriptures. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. It rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. It beareth all things, it believeth all things, it hopeth all things, and it will endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be knowledge, it shall varnish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that is, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is not part shall be done away with. Or excuse me, that which is part shall be done away with. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charities. These scriptures gave me strength. They gave me courage. They gave me hope. I realized I may have a partial truth around homosexuality. And they gave me permission to understand it and give me the possibility that I may be gay. Realizing that this may counter my understanding of my eternal salvation as I have currently been taught. I turned to the scriptures. I looked at a lot of scholastic research and read a lot. I looked at various spiritual practices. I prayed and I sought inspiration from the Holy Ghost. I stayed in dialogue with my friends my family, and my therapist. I have to say, homosexuality has looked so unfavorably in the LDS community that it is very difficult to have an honest, holistic approach and conversation. Many shared with me that they didn't agree with the church's LGBT policies, yet they feared their own losing of their church standing so they would not speak up and talk about it. One of my therapist's greatest words of advice was to have me find a tribe 
and group of people where I could honestly dialogue and explore my various feelings. So here are some of those experiences. Who did I invite into my tribe? Well, my therapist for sure. She was definitely part of my tribe. She asked incredible questions and allowed me the opportunity to sort through my beliefs and my fears. She had no particular end in mind other than for me to find out what was right for me. She trusted that the truth would find its way, and she helped me find that trust as well. Certain select friends, they were both LDS and non-LDS, they were both married and single. They were all heterosexual at the time because I had no close homosexual friends at that time. Those who stayed in my tribe were people who showed sincere curiosity and openness about the possibility. They engaged in conversations and they, they allowed me to share my constant swinging back and forth of whether I was or wasn't. They engaged in conversations about their own self. And they were vulnerable with me in regards to their own issues, which gave me the opportunity to be vulnerable with them. I was not their project. They challenged my thinking, yet from a perspective of helping me again find what was right for me, not their agenda. Certain family members stayed in my tribe. I had two, two siblings especially who shared their love with me. My younger brother, when I told him, expressed to me that he wanted me a part of his life no matter what. And he wanted me to be a part of his children's life no matter what. He said to me, no matter who you date or who you're in relationship with, they are always welcome in my home. My sister also was equally supportive. Get it together. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I don't want to pass out, so I do have to breathe. <laughs> 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 but I also need to find my thing. Okay, sorry, thanks. My sister was equally responsive and helpful and supportive. She shared that her greatest concern and love for me was for me to find happiness in a committed relationship. So, who didn't stay in my tribe? There were certain friends who would immediately jump to conclusions. Many of them assumed perversion, or that I would just simply throw out every value I ever had because I was possibly gay. I heard comments such as these. Are you going to start drinking now? Are you going to just have sex with any woman you date? You do realize your eternal salvation is at risk, don't you? You'll have to move so that your young woman won't see you dating a woman. I could never turn my back on the Lord. Did you really ever believe the gospel? I think you just haven't found the right man yet. Um, I do believe that these people and these friends did love me, and I think they meant well. Yet I don't think they realize how harmful those voices are. So, I had to remove myself from these voices for a time. My bishop did not stay in my tribe. Not because I wasn't willing to have somebody counter some of my feelings, but because it seemed his main emphasis was ensuring that I was aware of the church's defined consequences to homosexual behavior. He asked no questions like, what this challenge might feel like. How am I working through this? What gospel principles are helping me through this difficult time? What does it feel like to come to church? These statements were absolute. There seemed to be little understanding for what felt like to have, have lived in the church for all my life, having served, and then if I was honest with what, who I truly was, that I would then be kicked out. These feelings felt very isolating to me. It was painful. I think he's a good man. I think he means well. Yet I don't believe that he's trained, nor does he know how to work with cognitive dissonance. Who is slowly coming back in my tribe? My parents. After I told them, my parents shared their love with me the best that they could. I know that I had caught them off guard. What became hard was after sharing my feelings, there seemed to be radio silence for several months. There and we talked, yet everything was very surfacy. My parents and my bishop, what I wanted from them was to just be curious about my experience. 
I knew they didn't agree with it, but I thought they could be curious. I felt like I'd been bold to tell them about my same gender attraction, and I wanted them to carry some of the relationship work. But what I realized is that until I am happy and more comfortable with my life, they won't be happy or comfortable with me as well. So what I began to do is opening up more to them and let them know how I was happy. I know it doesn't look like it right now, but I am actually happy. <laughs> This actually helped our relationship tremendously. There was sincere fear of being of loss when I was dealing with my same sense retraction. It was very intense, and these uh, feelings surfaced in various forms and at different times. The practice of meditation, self-compassion, prayer and study that centered on pride, humility, truth, and compassion all seemed to help me and ground me. Friends and family who allowed me just to express my fears and my sadness really helped me a lot too. This helped me a lot too. I continually kept thinking Jesus wasn't loved in his own country, and that gave me strength. And what I realized though was there was this false sense of safety that was linked to being part of a majority. And that was now transforming into a love and a security of truth that I had been given through the Holy Ghost as I moved into this marginalized and minority class. I have to express my sincere appreciation to the LGBT community. They know what it feels like to be isolated, to be judged, and how important support is. And what I've loved about them is they will love anybody because they understand the importance of it. So where have I landed? I have read a lot of blogs, I've read a lot of posts from the LGBT community who have been on similar journeys. Some of them have found answers in staying in the church and choosing not to act upon their sexual orientation. I fully honor them and I support their decision. For me, I believe the Lord is fully aware of accepting my innate feelings that I have. I do believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I strive to live core Christian teachings. I no longer believe my salvation is at risk because of my life and, and the choices I'm making. I am happy dating women right now and seeking a loving, healthy, monogamous partnership. A defining moment for me was when I was reading Moroni 7. It said, Wherefore, all things which are good cometh of God, but behold, that which is of God inviteth and enticeth to do good continually. Wherefore, everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good, and to love God and to serve Him, is inspired of God. I had an undeniable feeling of love and support and understanding come over me. God knew my heart, and He loved me. He's mindful of our lives. I know that I'm a good person, and I know that I'm seeking to do good. We are here to gain experience, and I have learned from this incredible spiritual experience about compassion, about kindness, about faith, about trust, about humility, and about charity. I've also learned about judgment, humiliation, pride, and ego. I'm happy, and I'm at peace right now. I share more freely now when it feels right. I'm not out waving the LGBT flag. Yet I do speak up to social issues where they feel misinterpreted and misunderstood. I'm more accepting of others' homophobia and discomfort because I work through my own. I share that my sexual orientation is not a secret, but it is very sacred to me. I see being gay as one aspect of myself it would, amongst a plethora of other dimensions. A friend recently asked me if someone asked her about me, what should she say? And I said, well, have them call me. I'd like to talk to them. But if that doesn't feel comfortable, what I'd like you to say is she's a believer in Christ and she experiences same gen gender attraction and she's more kind and more happy now. I'm close to being done. My initial response to difficult conversations is to run away from them and avoid them. Yet remember that the core principle of experiencing truth is to stay in community with it. So I'm choosing now to stay in, some, uh, in what sometimes feels like difficult and heated dialogue, two opposing opinions. Many believe in this community I am committing a sin, and they have oftentimes shared that with me. These discussions seem to be creating cognitive dissonance now. 
I don't want to lose my own LDS community, and I choose to live my truth. I believe through charity we can find a common ground. A friend recently said to me, you are causing my head to explode. I haven't known anyone gay with a testimony. I mentally doubted that. <laughs> but then she asked me, well, what can I do for you? And I said to her, I want you to stay open. I want you to pray for understanding. I want you to stay and be my friend. And I want you to share what experiences you're having through prayer with me and with others. I challenge each of us to follow Jesus' lead and to stay with paradox in relationship with truth that our minds may be stretched and our hearts open to new understandings and the deeper truths and blessings that Heavenly Father has for us. Remember, we may only partly know the truth. I pray that each of us have the courage to openly stay in these dialogues with charity as our guide. I hope one day soon we will put this negative energy associated with homosexuality towards social issues that I think really matter, like climate change, racism, xenophobia, sexism, abusive relationships, and the opioid epidemic that's really killing our nation. Let's really make some beneficial change to our community. And I say this thing humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Kent and Allison, and um, my name is Mike Klein. I'll be the concluding speaker in this uh, session here. Um, I think it's the first time I'm uh, speaking uh, in front of a church crowd without a white shirt and tie. A little different, but um, that's thanks to my husband who dressed me this morning. <laughs> I actually uh, I gained a, a, a very big wardrobe of clothes when I got married to him a year ago, <laughs> which is a huge benefit. <laughs> Um, I will uh, briefly talk, I know, again, we don't have a lot of time, but and uh, there's probably, I could speak hours and hours and hours about my experiences, um, so I'm going to have to really, really be uh, brief on them, but um, I'll talk about um, kind of who I am, my journey, and then uh, things that I've learned uh, through this journey, particularly in the last couple of years. Um, and as Kent said, we all have different stories, different perspectives, obviously this is my perspective. Um, one thing, though, that I do want to not forget, and I'll just mention at the beginning, is I love that scripture that Allison shared in Moroni about all good things come from God. And I definitely, definitely uh, have a, a testimony of that or a, a feeling of that, which I'm going to share in my experiences, the decisions I made. I was born in Mesa, Arizona, um, so I'm coming from Arizona. I grew up in an LDS, active LDS home. Uh, father's side was uh, come from pioneer ancestry. Uh, my mother was um, from Uruguay and converted to the church in Uruguay and immigrated to the United States um, with her mother and siblings. Um, thankfully, my aunt is here today. My mom's sister is here today. I appreciate that. And I've got two other cousins here, so I appreciate that as well. And I'll talk about family support in a minute. Um, I, growing up, uh, I don't particularly remember, you know, specifically any thoughts or didn't you know, sexual preoccupation or anything as I was a younger child, but I do know that as a teenager, as I started to grow up, my friends were talking about going on dates and excited to go on a date with a girl or kiss a girl or whatever it was, I, you know, that wasn't me, and I didn't have any of those same thoughts or feelings to the contrary. I was thinking about guys at that time, and it was kind of scary to me. I didn't understand what that meant, but I just kind of shelved it. Um, I was very active in church. I had my own testimony growing as a teenager. Uh, attending general conference, I specifically remember the feelings I felt. Um, I was the always serving deacon's quorum president and teacher's quorum presidency, first assistant priest quorum. Uh, I served a mission in Ecuador. And I just bring these things up just so you know where I'm coming from. Um, on my mission, I had the privilege of, of serving also there in as, as in the leadership positions there, including assistant to the president. And I thought that during that time on a mission, like several stories you've probably have heard, that my attraction to men would diminish or go away. I expected that to happen. I expected that God 
uh, not, not necessarily I didn't have any bargain with him, but just the, the fact that I was serving him so faithfully and with all my heart, soul, and mind that, that he would put in my path the way to, to cure what I was told was something that was curable. <coughs> Um, I came home from my mission, got involved in, in church immediately, obviously, and I was put in an elders quorum presidency just right when I came home from my mission. I was I started dating as I was supposed to. The expectation was I'd be married. Um, so, and I did, I, I met a girl that I uh, became friends with. She was in uh, one of my cousin's wards, and uh, we ended up getting married. Um, I do want, to, I think it's important to note that she's the only girl I've ever kissed, and uh, the only girl I'll ever kiss, but, uh, um, so, you know, I wasn't somebody that was, uh, that was uh, dating and a lot of girls and, 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 and wanting that, but, but I did what I was supposed to do, and that's what I always did. Um, we uh, ended up, uh, we were married for uh, about 21 years, uh, have seven children, um, ranging from 21-year-old as my oldest down to... Uh, nine-year-old twin girls. They're all active in the church. My oldest son returned from a mission in Japan a year ago. My second son is uh, has a call to Argentina and leaves in a couple of months. So my children continue to go to church. My family, extended family, all my parents and siblings all are active in the church. So what got me to this point now, where I'm now married to a man, um, and uh, Life is a lot different than I had ever expected it to be. Well, back when I did first get, when I first got married to my wife at the time, um, I went through a lot of mental and emotional turmoil, as has been shared. That is very, very similar to me. The turmoil that comes from believing strongly in God, and that's never changed, and believing strongly in the church institution and what was being taught, and how that didn't match up with what I was feeling. <coughs> And that turmoil um, ended up just causing a huge wedge between my wife at the time and me. And it had been through our whole marriage, unfortunately. But I did typical things. This was 20 years ago. Counseling, talking to my bishop. I, was, I will say that as an adult, you know, coming home from my mission, I was always close to my bishop, always close to my state president. They were aware of my feelings and my thoughts. And even through all that, I was elders quorum president, ward mission leader, I was a counselor in two bishoprics, I was a high counselor, and all that service, you know, I'll, in my mind it was despite the, you know, why do you keep calling me to these things when I'm, I'm, I'm you know, attracted to men and I'm having these difficulties and these issues, and, and my, my testimony of, of what the, the gospel was never waned and never changed, but it just didn't make sense to me. And, so with that, I came to a point where I was literally mentally and emotionally just ripping apart. And so counseling did lots of that. Uh, back in the day, there was evergreen groups. If anybody remembers those, I did that. I did reparative therapy. I met with, again, the church leaders at the time. And nothing I can say, honestly now today, nothing anybody said was helpful to me or there were answers. There were, nobody had answers um, back then, and, and the answers that uh, anybody tried to give just didn't help me specifically. Um, the, the one, I guess the one help that I do say that church leaders did give me is that they didn't give up on me in the sense that they still wanted me to be participating around <coughs> serving, and, and that, that part was helpful. But, um, so through this transition, you know, going through um, understanding who I was and the feelings that just weren't going away and I realized as I pled and pled and pled for God to change my attraction to men because here I have a family, I have kids, it's, you know, I believed in the salvation and all that, um, I realized that that wasn't going away so I started uh, pleading that my life would end. It's just, it wasn't worth, I thought it wasn't worth living and that went on for a, quite a long time of thinking about, you know, how can I just end it all because it's not worth living anymore, um, and um, my children, I think just having my kids and that love that I share with my kids is what kept me kept me around for so long, but uh, but there came a point in time when that, that just wasn't enough either, and I specifically remember talking with my bishop 
about this, and uh, even my state president at the time, and it was, they both helped me understand that getting away from my marriage that I was in was much better than, and staying alive was much better than being dead. And so, uh, through, again, working with therapists, nothing, nothing happened on a whim, nothing was without much prayer, fasting, thought, but I came to the decision that I needed to divorce, and I just, I couldn't continue that way. Um, I had a particular experience one time when I was going through, we separated back in March of 2015, and I was, I came out, I was driving somewhere, driving down the freeway, maybe it was to work or whatever, and I, I, can, I distinctly remember a, a feeling from God telling me that he does not require me to be miserable, that the purpose of this life isn't to be miserable, to pass some test, to then get to the other side. And, and I just felt such an overwhelming love from him that the purpose of this life is to learn to love, to feel loved and love. And so I felt um, that that was the right decision to get divorced. And after, and that was just taken in isolation, just I'm going to get divorced. I didn't know what was going to happen beyond that. Then a few months went by and I decided, what am I going to do now? Do I want to be single? Do I want... I, I knew for a fact I would never date another woman, so that wasn't even on the table. <laughs> Sorry, women there. <laughs> but um, I wanted to decide, you know, I wanted to know what I'm going to do. I'm, 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 you know, still have a few years ahead of me, hopefully, and, and what am I going to do? So I prayed a lot about it and made the conscious decision, I'm going to now start dating men. And I, I knew what that would mean. Um, I, I had a conversation with my state president again, and he was so supportive. He wasn't telling me what to do, what not to do, but the good things that he said was, I love and respect you, and whatever you decide, I will support you. He says there may be consequences from a church institution standpoint, but, you know, I love and support you. And so I took that information and, again, prayed about it, decided to date, and um, miraculously, and I believe definitely believe God was guiding me is that I met Jason uh, not too long after that I decided to date and um, and we met in late 2015 and we were married in August of 2016 so it's, we just had our one-year anniversary and uh, in that process of dating Jason what was amazing to me is that I felt so much love for and from God I didn't expect that I, you know, the, getting away from this, this uh, uh, depressive feeling that I felt that I was in the wrong situation and the wrong relationship and just, it was just negative, 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 no peace. I just, and then I changed to a, to a relationship that was just so peaceful. Not only, so there was the, you know, physical, emotional, spiritual, mental uh, attraction and combination that I just... I just felt so much love for God because I felt like He allowed me to have this experience. He allowed me to have this relationship. And that's why I was referencing that scripture that Allison brought up in Moroni, is that anything that brings you closer to God is good. And I don't, I don't need somebody else to agree with me on that because I feel it myself. Um, but I just felt that this was the right uh, relationship to have. And um, so I'm, I know I'm going to be running out of time here, but... There's my timer there. But, um, so going through that decision, I do want to let you know, my, so from a family standpoint, however, I have seven kids, again, active in the church. They haven't been as uh, happy about my decision. Um, my parents haven't been happy about my decision. My siblings haven't been happy about my decision. Uh, in fact, there's, that's caused issues um, relationship-wise with them, um, I'm, which I continue to work through. But um, thankfully, I've had extended family that have been very supportive of me and just, you know, showing that love. You don't have to agree with somebody to love somebody. You don't have to uh, 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 prove anything to them um, by loving them and, 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 and including them in your life. Um, one other thing, experience-wise, so when Jason and I got married, I, I, I've continued to attend church um, and... Uh, you know, you know, I don't participate by having a calling, but I moved after I got divorced and moved into a new ward. I moved into a ward that they, nobody knew me. My bishop knew that I was 
dating, or then, then we ended up getting married, I think is when I moved into there. And I, basically that was a warden mason, I was completely ignored. Uh, never talked, never met really with the bishop other than one time, and so you know, we got married. Um, the ward members have been very, uh, just ignore us basically. He comes to church, or was coming to church with me. But I just share that just as, because I have a con contrasting experience. Um, just a month ago we moved to Phoenix from Mesa, and the ward's a lot more diverse. And we've had a lot of people come up to us and talk to us. And want to introduce them as my husband. And oh, that's great. And they're loving and kind. So I, I, so one of the things that we want to talk about is what church leaders can do or other members can do is just be kind, just be accepting, just be, I mean, just include people in your, in your circle. Because um, I've seen it both ways. And, um, you know, there was a time Jason didn't want to come to church because, you know, people weren't happy that we were there. Um, and then... Uh, you know, people ask me, why do you still go to church? And I, um, probably the, the biggest thing that I wanted to share about that is this, is the feeling, I still do feel like I can worship God at church. Um, I'm not there every Sunday, but the feelings that I have for God, and I know we can worship God in many places, at many times, and that's one place that's still familiar to, to me to worship and then um, lastly, I just will close by saying that, the, that as, a, as a gay Mormon man now, the personal revelation to me has been so key in my development and my learning. Um, I believe, I, you know, I grew up in a situation where we were taught to follow you know, one set of rules, and, it's, and I won't even say it's not even necessarily following the gospel, it's just following a bunch of rules, and I have discovered that, and we have many scriptures that state this, that, you know, your personal relationship with God is key, um, and that relationship doesn't have to go through anybody or anything, um, and so that has helped so much in my life. I mean, the, 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 the change from the misery to the joy has been you know, complete 180 um, for me, and it's made me feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to, to, to live. It's fun to be a part of a community. It's fun to have friends. It's fun, and, and it's even, you know, when I go to church, it's fun to go to church, too, because I want to be there. I mean, there's so many things um, that I, I've learned from your motive and your, the thoughts and intents of your heart. There's a scripture that says that. You know, God is judging us on the thoughts and intents of our heart. So and that, that has just opened me up to, to really understand how I can communicate with him and how I can do things to honor him. And uh, I appreciate everybody being here today, and I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to our three presenters today. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but I would imagine that any of these guys would be happy if you would just grab them and had any questions for them. We have a five-minute break, and then we've actually outgrown this room. So we're, the next hour, in five minutes, we're going to start in Cascade B. Does anybody know where Cascade B is? That's right, across. right. Oh, okay. So it's a little bigger room, and um, then everybody should have a place to sit. Um, and so the next hour, starting in five minutes in Cascade B, will also be. Let's get up out of the way.